Chris. I work at the graduate school as a graduate assistant. Welcome to the writing retreat. Please leave your settings on mute and video off during the presentation. You will have a few minutes at the end of the presentation to ask questions. You may post questions in the chat at any time or ask them verbally at the conclusion of the presentation. Our first two presenters are going to be Paul Luft and Allison Cook. Allison Cook has a master's of science in library science from the University of Kentucky and a bachelor of arts in history and museum studies. She serves as the library liaison for areas that include business, criminal justice, political science, and government information. Paul holds a master's in library science from Indian University and a bachelor's in pharmacy. He serves as the library liaison for all sciences, including engineering and medicine. So without any further ado, Paul and Allison, it's all yours. Okay, thanks. Well, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for coming on in, uh, you know, on Saturday morning here. Um, so today we're going to do a few things. We're going to take a look at where we can find good research articles and uh, how to utilize some of the database functions. And we're also going to show you how to organize your research. And um, Allison will have a few other little things for you too. Um, I'm gonna start us off with kind of uh, where do we go and find research articles? Uh, okay, so let me share my screen. Okay, for those that uh, don't know, this is the library landing page or the home page, and you get that from coming over here to Academics tab, and you scroll down, and we're the last one on uh, selection in the Dropbox. And here we have the landing page. And the first thing that comes up that you notice is uh, this general this, uh, search box. It's a Galileo search box. And you may see this also in your Cougar View courses um, or GoView. Uh, the one thing that I wanna point out about this search box is that it searches 150 databases at once. So for us that are a little bit more in the graduate program, we're usually more subject specific. And so searching in here for a term like global warming, we're gonna get like over a million um, results. And that tends to be cumbersome to go through and try to find articles on what you're trying to research. So we're going to show you a better way and a, a quicker way, or in other words, a more efficient way to find information. But before I get into all that, I do want you to know that there's a few things that can really help you. Uh, and, and I'm a grad student here at CSU too. So some of these things, you know, I, I you know, I've learned too, but one of the one of the most important thing you can do is develop a relationship with your librarian. Your librarian has a lot of um, you know, training and specialties in subject areas. Every subject area has a, a uh, subject specialist. Uh, you know, mine's the sciences and medicine. So when you develop that relationship, you know, it, 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 they can do several things like find you special resources. I, I belong to listserv. So sometimes I get, you know, I have some other ways of other than getting information from databases. Uh, Allison's excellent at, at government docs and, and policy. And I'll let her explain some of the things that she can do specially for you. So developing that relationship with your librarian is, is like real key. And if you don't know who your, your subject specialist librarian is, there's a quick way that you can find it. If you go to this, uh, this subject guides in the resource box here, if you select that, there is at the very bottom, well, close to the bottom, a, um, a subject guide, a 
that's entitled the research clinics at CSU libraries. If you click here, you will find the list of librarians and what subject areas under the service and faculty staff tab right here. Uh, or, yeah, is it down here? It was here. Oh, oh sorry, CSU subject uh, library and liaisons, right. So these are our emails and phone numbers, and these are the subject areas we cover. So you can find out who your subject librarian is. So that's really important to do. Um, the other thing, before we get into the databases and everything, another uh, nice thing to know is that there is a resource that, there's resources on every subject in the subject guide um, selection here. And some of you may not know what a subject guide is. It's a, it's, it's put together by all these subject librarians at the at CSU library and they're on you know the subjects areas of their specialty and they have special resources they help you find things and for instance for example we're going to go into the nursing one so if i click into the nursing one you can see for those that are um, medically inclined, uh, there, there's like evidence-based medicine, clinical trials, statistic information. So these are all resources that, um, that nurses need to um, do research and research papers. A lot of times they, they are interested in clinical trials. And so I have a little walkthrough of how they go through to find a research article on clinical trials. So Knowing that there are subject guides or libguides here for each subject is also very beneficial for you to get familiar with in, within your subject. All right, so let's go back to CSU libraries. Again, the resource box is your friend. Um, there's journals A to Z, and I'm going um, in a different segment like. Uh, Michelle Jones is going to explain a lot more of these links. So I'm not going to go into them in this segment. But the one thing we do want to go into is Galileo databases. So for those that might not know what Galileo is, it's a collection of databases that uh, CSU um, subscribes to. And as I said, there's 150, over 150 databases and growing in, in this collection. And if you select, if you search in this general search box, again, you'll search over 150 at once. And we want to kind of, again, do this a more efficient way. So if you scroll down to this selection that's databases by subject, and you select view all subjects, this will help you thumb through databases by subject area. So in the case that I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about doing something on global warming. So I could do biology, I could do environmental sciences, I could select any one of these that have to do with, with uh, global warming. And when you select that, you have a list of databases that come up that pertain to that subject, okay? So in this case, uh, I, well, first I want you to notice off to the right, there are uh, sponsors of these databases or, uh, so why that's important to get to know is, is some, some databases are easier to work with than others. Like I prefer the EBSCO databases and the ProQuest databases. So if I select ProQuest and let's go into the environmental collection series, I am going to uh, come to the landing page and here I could start typing in my search terms, but um, before I do that, I want to get famil more familiar with, with how this database is organizing information as it comes into it. And you say, what are you talking about, right? So if I go to the advanced search 
uh, feature of, the, of this database. And I'm thinking the term global warming. Now, when you start thinking about global warming, well, there's other things that come to mind, like maybe it's climate change or maybe it's called something else, right? Uh, I don't really know. And so we wanna know how this database, when it gets articles, is filing the, those uh, research articles. So if I go ahead and I select the thesaurus, I'm gonna come to, uh, it's gonna ask me, well, what type of thesaurus do you want? Well, right now I'm thinking I'm doing something on pollution. So I want the pollution thesaurus. So I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna type in the term global warming, okay? So when I come up there, it, there's this, and if I, uh, it says global warming, which is really nice. I'm thinking, okay, that's really good. So if I select on global warming, it should come up. Um, yeah, I guess that's our only choice. It usually gives us more. Um, so we'll try this in a different database too. But it looks like the term global warming is how this database works. Sometimes their climate change is another term that you can use. So we're gonna use global warming. And when we're thinking about a topic, we usually don't wanna just, that's what, you know, get a little bit more specific when we're thinking about our, what we're trying to research. So what do we want? Maybe mitigation, we'll try that. We'll select global warming and mitigation. And when we get here, we'll say, oh, wow, there's 34,000 results. And you're saying, well, that's still a lot of results. And that's true. So this is how we start thinking about how to limit all these results. First, we have, we could limit it to full text. Now this selection means that we have the articles currently right here and right now. We don't have to do what we call interlibrary loan or get them from another library. So we could select full text to narrow this field down a little bit and we'll get down to 25,000. And next we want uh, scholarly journals, right? We want journals that have been peer reviewed by other scientists and are good quality research articles. So if we hit scholarly journals, we'll get it down to 18,000. And another nice thing is we can see how a topic is trending a little bit uh, through, and usually we don't wanna go way back, not all the time, but we don't usually wanna go that far back. So we wanna think of uh, maybe in the last 10 years, we'll update this. And when we do that, you can see how many articles each year that uh, the global warming topic has kind of progressed, which is kind of nice. And so the next thing you're saying, well, we're still at 15,000 articles. Well, the next thing that's your friend over here is this, this subject area. If you, if you do a drop down, you can see within these 15,000 results how these articles are organized. And I've hit the more function, I can say, oh, okay, maybe I'm thinking more of studies on global warming and maybe I'm thinking uh, greenhouse gases. So uh, as you can see, you can start get narrowing down your topic um, quite a bit when you, when you hit this um, uh, subject um, function off to the left here. And you say, well, this is a ProQuest database. What about an EBSCO? It works the same way in an EBSCO database. So this is why I like these databases is that I can, you know, really zero down on a topic pretty quickly. And if I hit apply, then we are down to 3000 results. And that's still a lot, but again, I could, even limit it by location, or I could limit it even further down from here, or I could take the date range and get something a little bit more current. Because usually in grad school, we're really trying to look at things in the last five years. So if I do that, I'm down to 17 articles, 1700 articles, which is a lot easier to go through. The next thing, once you've 
got it to this stage and you're saying, oh, well, you know, maybe I want that article. Okay, well, if you select, let's say this is an article we want, right? And we select it. So I'm going to move our window of us a little bit over here to the left. Um, you'll notice that off, off to the right on the top here, there are function tabs like site. So we all know in the research paper, we're probably going to have to cite our resources, right? So this is a very handy little function um, in this database and many others that it does the citation for you. So you can copy and paste that citation into a Word document real quick if you had one open. And there you go. And you, another, um, whoops, sorry about that. I like showing this because sometimes when we copy and paste, things either get highlighted or they get unitalicized. And well, sometimes we will talk about indenting them properly for APA citation. So if you highlight this uh, citation and you go up to this, I'm going to expand this out a little bit. Um, this little um, box by the paragraph and you click get and you go down to the indentation and you put hanging indent and you hit OK. It scoots it over into proper APA citation. Some people don't know that, so that's why I like showing that. You can also, besides um, copying and pasting it into a Word document, email the article with the citation to yourself. So here we want to make sure we want to check the box uh, that says, hey, I want the uh, citation included when you email me this article, the PDF. And so you can check right here and you just fill out what your name and you just then hit send or done, continue right down here. So that's how it's not that hard to grab uh, an article and uh, email it to yourself. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the back to the results section. How are we doing? We're doing okay on time. I won't. Um, again, um, if I go back and I check and I choose a different type of database. Um, oops, I went to subject guide. Sorry about that. I had to go back to Galileo databases. We're just kind of walking through this again. We're not going to use the top box. We're going to say, hey, view all subjects. And um, I'm going to do one for maybe some of the nursing students that might see this. So I'm going to go to nursing. So I'll hit next here, and then right here is Nat Nursing and Allied Health. So if I go over here to Nursing and Allied Health, I'm like, okay, let's go find us a good nursing database that's a NEPSCO product, CINAHL. CINAHL is a very popular nursing database. So if I click CINAHL, and I come to the landing page, hopefully. Uh, and let's say I'm thinking about, um, you know, doing research on heart attacks. Well, in the medical profession, we have specialized terms for, and we have layman terms, right? So a heart attack would be a layman term. So again, I would want to think about how does this database think about heart attack? All right, so if I pick heart attack, oh, that's right, it's myocardial infarction. So that's really the term of heart attack that I want. So if I click on that, it, st it starts to scope it down. So maybe I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking maybe myocardial ischemia is really where I want to go with this. And then if I click on myocardial ischemia, it even breaks it down to even further. Maybe I'm thinking coronary artery disease and maybe I'm thinking of uh, angina. So maybe this is the term I want. So if I click on this, what's nice about this particular database is it then starts breaking it into subheadings like 
Uh, maybe I'm thinking I want to do drug therapy. Maybe I want to look at research on drug therapy with heart attacks. Or maybe I want to take a look at the PAPO on heart attacks. So what's nice about this particular database is you can really start scoping down on your topic. And once you've figured out what you all want, then you can hit, A, I want, I want this database to search articles that this is the major concept of maybe drug therapy and heart attack. And then I hit the search the database and we're gonna get a bunch of results. Well, not as many, but we narrowed it quite a bit down. And you can see, um, you, again, you go through the same process. Maybe I, I don't want, maybe I want articles that we have right now, we don't have the interlibrary loan, but since I haven't talked a little bit about interlibrary loan, I'll just kind of breeze over that. Is whenever you're in any database and it has this find it button, it may or it may mean that you have to enter library loan or may not have to enter library loan. It. Sometimes it's in another database. So to find out, you hit the find it button. And when you hit the find it button, it comes to this page. Come on, find it button. Sometimes it takes a little bit. And it's going to ask me to log in, uh, but it also, I think it's also telling me already that this is linked to another um, database. So if I clicked on it, I would go to the article, but if it wasn't there, it would ask me to fill out a form. How are we doing, Allison? Do you, do you need? Okay, I'm doing okay. Okay, I'll keep going. Okay, so let's try to see if I can find one that's not uh, in another database. Okay, so let's see if this one, we have to interlibrary loan because it's good for you to know. And interlibrary loan um, can take, you know, as short as the same day or as long as a month. It all depends on where it's coming from. If it's coming within the United States, it's usually a very short time. But sometimes I've, you know, if it's in a different country and they have to scan the article, it can take a while. So here we go with login service. I'm going to log, log in with my um, CSU ID. And since I'm already logged in in a different program, it already has detected that. But you can see there is no link to another database right here. It says, hey, let's request interlibrary loan. So if I select this, a little form will come up. I hope. No, I know. Well, it just takes a little while. Um, and a lot of it's already auto filled out for you, as you can see. If it has an asterisk, it needs to be auto filled. And you say, OK, author, right? I, it didn't fill out the author. Well, if you go back to uh, this screen and you hit the citation button, you can say, oh, there is no real author. So, you know, I'm going to put uh, none in this case. I'll just put none. Uh, and then I'll keep on scrolling down and say, oh, yeah, I need to have this soon, right? Well, maybe they can get to it by Monday, maybe. And we never want to pay anything. So we definitely want to put a big zero there. And you'd put the department that you are uh, doing this for. So I'm doing, do it. I'm a nursing student this time. So, and then you just hit submit request. And that's how easy it is to interlibrary loan. It's just, it may take a little bit of time. So, you know, the point being is the earlier you start, the more options you have. You don't have to you know, you don't have to be just limited to the articles we have right here and now. Um, so that's kind of the, the point of that too as well. Um, and uh, where else? What else can we show? Let's just, uh, again, this is an EBSCO database. So let's, let's just go through the same steps. Let's just say, hey, I want to link it to full text. So that means I got rid of all those find it buttons. They're gone now. And um, let's just say, hey, I want to uh, take a look at um, some subcategories. 
And maybe I'm looking at outcomes. That looks interesting. Maybe I want some on op outcomes. Maybe I'm doing things with particular patient type like diabetes. So you can update it and you can see you can get very, very specific and, you know, and, and scroll down a lot of or uh, skew down a lot of the results to more specifically what you're looking for. And again, in, in, a, in the Sentinel nursing database, notice that we didn't have off to the side peer reviewed. That's because in this particular database, everything has been already peer reviewed. So there's no need for that, that selection. And another thing be, that I'd like to just go over real quick, and then I'll turn it over to Allison. Um, there are other things in these databases that they can do before you even do the search, right? So maybe I am looking for just female patients or maybe I'm looking for evidence-based medicine types. So these things can be found over sometimes in these advanced search functions, um, like here is, oh, this one has a button, that's right, uh, evidence-based practices. So the more familiar you get to go, get with your databases in your subject areas, the better and quicker you'll become at finding articles. But again, I'll go back to librarians are here to help you. And, you know, you can call and contact us various ways. And you can even chat with us through this chat box. So I hope that's been helpful. And I think I'm going to turn this over to Allison and let her run from here. Okay, hey, thanks, Paul. Um, hi, I'm Allison Cook, as, as mentioned. Um, I'm the Business and Government Information Librarian. And what I'm gonna go over this morning is um, how to organize and keep the information you find um, stored in a way that is easy to access again and where you'll be able to find it again. Because um, I know me personally and my, some of my research projects, I find all this great information and I don't have time to print it out or save it or put it on a thumb drive. And I think I remember how to get back there. And when I go back later, I have no, I can't find it again. So I'm gonna teach you some tools on how to keep it organized and how to get back to those searches that were really, really productive for you um, so that you don't have that frustration of where's that information? What article was that that piece of information I need? Because for some of the larger research projects, you're gonna get tons of articles, possibly interviews, newspaper articles. You might even have to collaborate with other people. So I'm gonna just teach you briefly um, a few tools um, and I'm gonna be going through a lot of information. So if you have a question, just let me know, uh, interrupt me. Um, okay, let me go ahead and share my screen. And I'm not gonna go through my entire PowerPoint. Um, it looks a lot more than it is. Um, if I will uh, give this file to, I guess whoever I need to, to um, if you wanna go back to it earlier, uh, later, um, So you don't have to, you know, uh, take notes in a frenzy. Um, but I, I'll be going back and forth between this and um, uh, the browser just to demonstrate a few things. So part of making research a lot less frustrating is having an evolving plan. And I say an evolving plan because just because you plan for one thing or have one thesis and one argument in mind, doesn't mean it always has to stay that way. Now, sometimes your assignments are gonna be set in stone. Your uh, professor wants a specific topic or thing written about, but a lot of times your topic is kind of what you're generating on your own. And when you have some sort of plan, um, it saves time. You can get back to the information that you need 
um, bibliographies, footnotes, endnotes are, can be easily generated. And you don't repeat the same searches over and over again, which often are not as productive because um, the keywords that you're using are using the, or giving you the same sources that aren't relevant to your, to your source. So um, I'm gonna show you a way that I've used and kind of um, through teaching and doing my own research, I've kind of come up with this system um, of different elements. So I, what I did was I combined them all for you guys and I can give you this um, uh, file too that you can um, make a copy of and use or not use. Uh, edit it so it fits more of your research needs, whatever you want to do with it. Um, but this is just one way to um, access it. Um, so as Paul mentioned um, and showed you a little bit about using keywords and subject headings in, uh, to find information, um, especially in the larger uh, research projects, it's easy to keep using the same unsuccessful um, keywords and subject headings um, and getting the same resources. And that can be really frustrating. And I just, um, I'm not gonna go into detail about subject headings, um, but subject headings are um, established by a database publisher or a journal, um, you know, it's, it's controlled vocabulary. So a lot of times it's not intuitive but that's how a lot of databases are organized. So knowing that they exist and kind of what they are can really be beneficial, even if you don't know in depth or um, how they're created or anything like that. Um, it can be really beneficial knowing where they are so you can turn them into keywords or search them as a subject heading and that can help you generate more uh, successful searches uh, in your research. Keywords, as we all know, is more natural language. They're more intuitive, um, easier to generate, but they're not always as successful because that's not how the database is thinking. So what I found and a lot of students have found um, that I've taught is um, tracking your search terms is a really good way to keep them all organized remember which ones were good, which ones didn't work so well. Um, and it, it can help you find those successful um, search lists that you could have sworn it was in the library catalog, but you don't remember which terms or what you used. And so um, this link here will take you to the spreadsheet, the Google sheet I, I made um, to help you organize. Um, and we'll look at that in just a second. So a great way when you're stuck um, is to find keywords and subject headings that are, um, that if you're kind of lost in not knowing, um, you know, the ones you're using aren't as successful, um, the same sources keep coming up. Um, try using synonyms, uh, Boolean operators, which, is using like and, not, or um, putting phrases in quotation marks so it searches the entire phrase. Um, those can be really helpful, um, but you can also piggyback off of other sources. So let's pretend that this source right here um, is right, like it's, it's exactly what you need. So how do you form, find more like it? Well, this was from uh, the library catalog. And so what you can do is look for the subjects. Um, and this is an ebook. Uh, sorry, that keeps coming. Um, where it's uh, highlighted over there. Um, you can use try using those as subject terms, um, keywords, um, and put it into the search engine um, and see what comes out. Um, Often clicking on them is not really all, always the best way because it can end up producing like more irrelevant results because it's giving you everything under that one subject heading. So, um, and often those can be subjective on who indexed them and whatnot, but 
uh, that's one way to get better keywords. Um, databases also offer um, suggestions. So these are just a couple of screenshots from uh, ProQuest. If you scroll to the bottom of a search result, it'll give you um, uh, additional um, keywords uh, to try out that might be helpful. Um, and when in most databases, when you're typing in the search bar, it'll start generating a list. Um, and you may not have thought uh, if you're um, looking for, you know, oral histories of World War II veterans, you may not, not have thought to um, look at the Library of Congress Veteran, uh, Veterans History Project, which is a vast database of um, testimonies from veterans of all, all wars. Um, and here again, um, from another database um, in Galileo, from a journal article, you have the same uh, idea that there's um, uh, subject ideas that you can use for your keywords. And when you're in uh, the library catalog, these are some of the subject terms used. You can put those in the search search bar um, and you search it as a subject or just a regular old keyword. Okay. Oops, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna switch over to my browser. Um, For a second and we're going to just go over organizing your keywords. So this is the um, spreadsheet I created. Um, so I have blank forms and then um, examples of what you, um, how you can fill it out. You, um, once you make a copy of this, um, you can edit it however you want. Um, you can uh, delete out things, you know, just fix it to the way. If you um, find something helpful, you know, pick and choose out of it. And this isn't the right way to do things. It's just a way I've found over the years to make research easier. So this was my copy that I made. And we have keywords. Now, this may look scary, but stay with me on it. Um, so my topic is veterans, veteran stories from the Iraq war. So these concepts, you can just think of ideas and it's different words that you can put together or synonyms you can use. And the benefit to this is, is that let's say um, when you put and, um, in case you didn't know it, it will, the database will search for um, like if you used all these terms, it would search for everything in the database that has veterans, stories, Operation Iraqi Freedom, military, and PTSD. So um, sometimes it will be too narrowed if you do too many terms with and. Sometimes it still produces a ton of results, but... Um, and real quick, sorry, the um, ORs are just different ways you can phrase an idea. So for concept three, we have um, different ways to say the Iraq war. Um, stories, different ways to say stories. Um, so, and then you can add your own. Um, you can just use one or two concepts. And this way you can highlight um, which ones work. Like if this was really successful, you can check off keep. If this one was terrible, you can like highlight it red, don't use these or don't use this combination. So you can do this before and as you start researching because having it before gives you an idea of where to start. Um, sometimes if you go into research just blind, um, and just start typing in keywords. Sometimes it'll end up wasting time because you really don't know what you're looking for, but sometimes you just need to do that. So it really just depends on, um, you know, what your research is, how you like to do research and um, what phase of the research process you're in. But writing down your keywords is a great way 
to just remember it so you can always get back to it. Okay, so let me get back to PowerPoint. So within GillFind, um, you can log into your library account. I'll just show you. Um, so this is, I've already logged in and we'll do this. Oh no. Well, they told me no. Okay, let me re-log in. Okay, so, oops. Okay, so um, we can, let's say we're just looking for books, so we'll use some of the tools that Paul taught us, and then let's just say from 2002 to present. Okay, so I've already saved some of these um, for the purpose of this presentation. Oops, I didn't mean to hit that. So um, one thing that can be really helpful is uh, using some of the features that are in Gilfine to keep stuff organized. So one way you can do that is um, save it to your account. So when you click on this little thumbtack, it'll go to your favorites page. And um, there you can get back to it at any time. So once you log in again, you click the thumbtack up there. And there's, there's the book. Um, you can do a lot of other uh, things within um, the catalog that I, Paul already went over, but um, you can also go back, you can create labels to organize everything under one label. So as you can see, I've, I have a ton of labels to get back to different searches. Um, for different projects I've helped people with. Um, but let me get go back just one second. If this was a really great search results list, but you don't have time to get through everything and you've set up filters, you know, everything's clicked and you don't want to forget what you used, you can click on save query and it'll um, save to your search history. So you can click on save searches and there's veteran stories that have these parameters. You can also uh, set it so you get an alert for the search. So let's say the library gets a couple of new books in on this topic. Um, once it's added to the catalog, it'll let you know, hey, new stuff at the library. Um, if you want to get rid of the search, you can take it out there. And let's say you forgot to save the search. Well, you can easily go back to your search history and find it there. So that's a really handy tool to getting back to um, getting back to sources that you really want to save. Um, so in Galileo. Um, we have the same, and most databases have a lot of the same features. They're just in different spots of the database. So one thing that's really nice about Galileo is that um, when you're searching through the discovery bar, that's kind of like the Google of that I just typed in, it'll give you 2 million results for this. Um, you can save it all regardless of what database it's coming from, you can save it to your account um, 
um, that you just, it's a free account that you create, um, but it'll allow you to save um, searches and different articles. So you can click on full text. Oops. Okay, we'll just leave it like that for now. So, um, actually, let me do one more. Let me find ebooks. And so, from just limit doing a few limiters, we went from 2 million to 408. So that's, that's pretty handy um, right there. So thank you, Allison. We only have a couple minutes remaining for Q and A. Oh, okay. Um, I'll go through the rest real quick, but through Galileo, you can um, click on uh, add to folder and it'll save your, um, you can save it to a generic folder and then later on go to my folder and then articles will be listed there. And then you can create a new folder um, and move it later. Um, so it's, it's a really handy uh, tool that Galileo has. But the problem is, is what if you're using multiple databases um, that aren't together? Um, oh, you can also, um, oh, no, oh, shoot. Okay. Um, real quick, um, so you can do a lot of the same things in Galileo regardless of the database. Um, if you're going to save the link, remember to save the permalink. Using the browser bar um, isn't going to bring you back to the source. It'll just give you an error page. Um, and then over here, you can um, save to a folder, print it, email it, uh, get the citation, create a note. Uh, um, okay, so using a spreadsheet uh, real quick is really handy because you can keep all your search information uh, from multiple locations, uh, add the citation, um, and easily retrieve it later. So um, this is what I was talking about earlier you know, they're two different databases, a lot of the same features, but you can't easily save it to one thing. Um, in ProQuest, you can save it to, and I recommend using Google Drive and Google Sheets because um, it's free, the school provides it, most databases allow you to save to it. Um, these are just instructions on how to move files. And um, like I said, there's no right way to do this. Um, let me show you the spreadsheet real quick. So we looked at a couple of different sources. That those were my keywords that I can use to get back to. And then these are some of the sources. So th this was one of the books we looked at. It's an ebook, the date we accessed it. So we can say, well, if it was available yesterday, it should be available today, but sometimes research projects can take years. This is the permalink. So if you want to get back to this, um, this exact uh, resource, you can easily get back to it. Um, the citation, um, if you're not ready to create your bibliography, you can have the citation here and then just format it later and double check it. If you don't want to use the keyword spreadsheet, you can use um, this column to use filters, the filters that you used, um, keywords that you use um, that you want to note to remember. So this is a lot easier to say, 
what was that source? Um, I think it was called red, white and something. Oh, here it is. And then you quickly in minutes get back to it. And then for those who end up doing a literature review, um, this is, I created this spreadsheet a while ago that faculty really liked. Um, and it's just a way to log and keep track of the articles you read because when you're doing a literature review, you're gonna have a ton of information and books and articles that you're describing to. So it's easy to get them all over the place, get frustrated because you can't find the one you want. So by keeping track of them, you have the citation, um, which you can link with the permalink, um, keep track of what exactly are they studying and how does it apply to your research. Um, from this research project, I needed to know the type of institution they were looking at and the, uh, the size of the library. Um, and then the methods that they were using, um, the parameters of their study, um, what they found and some of the reflections. You don't have to use any of these titles of the columns and I put little notes so you can later go back. But basically um, it's, a, it's a good way to keep everything, you know where it is, you can find it again and you're not overwhelmed with a stack of papers that you have to find the one article out of 20 that you read uh, like last week. So um, like I said, there's no right way to do it but this is how I've done it. Um, and you can, like Paul said, we're here to help. Um, I had to go through this really fast and a lot of information. So um, you can email me. Um, I'm usually on Zoom, Google Teams, or Microsoft Teams, Google Hangouts. Um, you just need to use my email and call. <laughs> um, so sorry, I went a little over two minutes, but um, anybody have any questions? The only um, question I've seen is, uh, how will they get to your PowerPoint and share? Um, I guess I will send it to uh, Dr. Yates and she'll probably send it out as a general email. Um, I'd assume that's what she's done in the past. So she could do that or we, she could decide to post it on the graduate school website. We'll see what she wants. That to do. Cool. Yeah. Um, if you don't see it, just feel free to email me and ask for it. Um, the links to these things and um, always feel free to ask for, for help. We live for this stuff. <laughs> Participants, uh, you can use the breakout room icon in the bottom of the screen if you're moving to another room or you can move to the main room and the host will help you move into the next room for the next 10 o'clock session. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Allison. It was very informative and I know you got kind of crunched for time, but thank you very much. <laughs>